now. Uh, so Siddhartha, I guess I'll, I'll let you talk because I think you had a, some uh, some ideas that you wanted to get out there. All right, yeah. Um, so obviously I've been thinking quite a bit lately about if we're going to try to actually turn this into a real project that has any amount of say in the real world, uh, how are we supposed to go about that in a way where we're not just making fools of ourselves? And I've been taking some time watching a lot of debates between professional philosophers and shit and trying to figure out exactly how they're presenting their ideas and how those ideas might mesh with ours. And I think that we are a lot closer to a mainstream position than we might think. Um, maybe not necessarily mainstream, but something that's growing into the mainstream. Uh, so thinking about how other philosophers have tried to present their position, I think that there's really four areas in particular that they focus on, and actually in general probably just two or three. Uh, but those, of course, are an ontology, which is asking what is there. Uh, there's an ethics, which is how you should be. And then there's either an epistemology or a phenomenology, depending on uh, well, what school of thought you really prescribe to. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So moving on with that, I think that where we are lacking is a clear articulation of what our ideas along those dimensions are. And I don't think that's because we're lacking the intuition. We just don't, we haven't taken the time to really spell it out in, uh, in clear words. And I think that there is a growing movement that represents a lot of what we think is true and that that is manifest in modern idealism specifically. Um, and there's a lot of variations of that general ontology, but I want to just give a, a quick, a very quick rundown of what idealism is and, uh, some of the consequences of what that suggests for something like a political movement. Uh, so, whereas modern materialism comes, uh, it asks the question of what is there, and it comes to that from the perspective that all there is is material things, uh, and that everything that happens is the result of a material process, and that therefore we can quantify it and understand it uh, rigorously through something like science. Now, idealism doesn't necessarily say that science is wrong, uh, because if you're trying to say that science is wrong, then you're just setting yourself up for failure, because science is clearly not wrong, and uh, everybody will laugh at you if you try to say that. Uh, so we just have to kind of dispense with that altogether. We can argue against materialism and scientism uh, and the worship of science, but if we're trying to just say science is wrong, which obviously I haven't seen much of that here, but... Uh, you know, there's kind of a, a rejection of the scientific method in general. I think we see some of that, and that's, a, that's something that's going to get us into trouble if we aren't careful about our words there. Uh, so what idealism does say, though, is that the fundamental ontology of materialism has it backwards, because first and foremost, all that we know is consciousness. Uh, every moment of our life has always been delivered to us via subjective first-person experience. And quantified matter is first and foremost an abstraction out of that. So whenever we're trying to investigate what reality is, we have to start from the premise that consciousness is real, because that's all that we have. And then from there, we can approach the question of matter in a variety of ways. And what people, including uh, quantum theorists, have largely been coming up with is that matter in the way that we think about it doesn't really exist. Um, there aren't particles. There's uh, Things aren't really localized in quite the way that we often think about it. Um, philosophers have come to a lot of the same conclusions, that matter as we generally think about it is not how the world really is. And if we're going to have an interpretation of the world that takes into account all of the phenomena, uh, we can't we can't rest on matter as our primary substrate because it fails to take into account the one thing that we really know, which is our firsthand experience. So idealism takes the opposite approach, and it says that first and foremost, what everything is, is mental and experiential, uh, subjective. Um, and this isn't quite the same as a pantheism that would say that every single electron is conscious. This is not... Uh, really what, what the message is. Uh, but maybe nature as a whole, the entire universe, there's something that it's like to be the entire universe. And that is 
it, it lends in, into something that, that might be called panentheism. Uh, but it's the idea that the universe as a whole is something like a mind. And that is very similar to Platonism or Hinduism or um, even, you know, some strands of Christianity. It says the, uh, the world itself is a manifestation of God. Um, so that, working with that as a fundamental ontology, it gives us a framework where we can make the case for a god of Christianity or something of the sort. Once you've accepted idealism over materialism, and you're coming at this from the perspective that reality is based in mind more than matter, well then you have a framework where you can start trying to put, build in the qualities that you want to see in a Christian god. And not everybody will agree with you, and there's not a problem with that. I mean, philosophy is still a pretty vibrant community with a lot of disagreement. But if you at least can uh, solidify yourself as a position within idealism, which is a growing uh, philosophical position that's picking up a lot of traction lately, then we have a legitimate platform to try to express some of our other ideas, like our ethics. Um, or our phenomenology, what would like the, the phenomenon within the human life that we think is important. Idealism supports all of those things. And if we can at least establish ourselves as a, a, a supposition within idealism as a whole, then we have the grounds to be seen uh, with some amount of legitimacy in the academic field. And I think that that's necessary if, we're, if we want any amount of uh, appreciation from society at large. So with that, I guess I will uh, let anybody respond who would like to. So, uh, so you think that if we add in ideal I, idealism as this fundamental ontology, that's like a good jumping off point for a at least a conversation with the general public. Yes, absolutely. I think that. And I think that uh, we, we, by and large, are expressing an idealism. We just haven't put it in quite that language, which is making it difficult to build any kind of discourse. Uh, and so, yeah, if we come at this from the position that we are idealists first, and that is our philosophical basis, then that immediately puts us in a position where it's easier to defend the rest of our stances. Uh, I think this is actually, uh, you touch on something very uh, keen here. And that is the fact that uh, I think most people, well, all people really have to go into any kind of argument with some kind of a presupposition. And uh, due to the fact of being in the reign of quantity, right, the, most people's presuppositional argument is coming from a materialist point of view. Even people, exactly. even people who, you know, are, you know, nominally religious still default to a mostly materialist point of view and uh, you don't you're not going to have much progress you know debating anybody until you clear up that distinction right because uh, if you're only carried caring about materialism right uh, you're going to be you know naturally be a consequentialist right <laughs> you're not going to care too much about uh, you know overall morality and things like that uh, whereas how do you get a person to start caring about the, that those kinds of things that doesn't? Well, uh, yes, I think it's something, yeah. like you say, you need to clearly articulate from the first principle, right, that you are not approaching this the same way that they are. And, uh, and I think most people, right, they don't even consider another point of view, right, and just having that presented to them can start to, uh, I don't know, nurture some sort of, uh, I don't know, at least understanding of our point of view. So, yeah. yeah I, I, I agree with that completely. Yeah, so I definitely see what you're saying, and I definitely see the utility in that. Uh, now to play devil's advocate, um, this is still pretty lofty stuff. <laughs> um, and because most people aren't putting all of that much thought into it, right? I mean, you have people, right? Even people who would be, uh, you know, um, uh, friendly to our cause, right? That are not going to put that much amount of thinking into, you know, their ontology. 
they're just going to uh, take things at face value. And even if they approach from a material perspective, you can have sort of like a, a right-wing materialism. Uh, you might even say, to a certain point, you know, Nazism or fascism have uh, certain components of a, of a strong right-wing materialism, right? Um, now, how are you... Uh, so I, I guess my, my ultimate question is, I mean, do you really think that uh, this avenue, right, is going to reach the greatest number of people in the most efficient way? Uh, well, I think that you are right that most people don't spend too much time considering what their actual ontology is, but that doesn't change the fact that everybody does prescribe to an ontology one way or another. Uh, so if we approach this, I, mean, I don't think that every aspect of our outreach needs to be saturated with idealist propaganda because you're right that for a lot of people that's just going to go over their head they're not going to understand it and they're not really going to care even if they did understand it uh, but to, to get a seat at the table so to speak it, it's necessary to have a full articulation of what our actual range of beliefs are um, and I think that there are consequences of the idealist perspective that lend themselves to uh, some of the ethical considerations that we think are appropriate for a society to embrace at large. Uh, so if we come at this presenting ourselves as idealists, that will give a firm grounding to our ethical considerations. And the ethical considerations will also lend themselves to a metaphysical interpretation that will lead people towards idealism. Uh, so if we kind of do both at once, uh, talk to the people who are interested in an ontology, the people that understand that politics are just uh, applied philosophy, you know, because that is the truth. Politics is just applied philosophy, and some people appreciate that. So if we can take advantage of that and have conversations with people who might be political materialists and then convince them that um, – you know, idealism presents a more holistic approach that actually can explain the world in a much better way. Uh, you know, then then we're we're giving some amount of credibility to our downstream ideas as well. And this might not be, you say, the most effective way of doing it, but I think that efficiency kind of takes a uh, second role to truth. And if we're presenting an idea that is true and that can't just be uh, discarded on flimsy academic means, then we're going to set ourselves up much better in the future for spreading that idea. And uh, there's no, no reason we can't do both at once. Uh, okay, well, and, and I, I think I, I, I definitely agree, right? Uh, well, then my next point is I don't know, I'm not too well versed in idealism, but uh, are you talking about specifically like German idealism or... Uh, uh, well, it's it's kind of stemming from German idealism. There's a uh, a resurgence in modern idealism led by people. Uh, there, there's a few. Bernardo Kastrup is kind of the biggest name. Um, there's a, a neuroscience guy out of University of Virginia, Ed Kelly. There's a couple psychoanalysts. Mark Vernon is one. Uh, there's there's some you know a growing academic field that is uh, you know gaining steam day in and day out. And it, it is kind of, it, it borrows most of the main ideas from people like Kant and Hegel, Schopenhauer, uh, the German idealists, yeah. But there are uh, some other influences that have come in as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a living modern movement. It is uh, a group of neuroscientists and physicists and psychologists and philosophers that are all coming together with the understanding that materialism is leading to a lot of the same problems that we say that it is, and they're actively trying to, you know, lead to a rebirth of spirituality, maybe even religion. Um, but and but uh, well, let's look at uh, a few of the people that you said, right? Uh, you know, most notably Hegel, right? Uh, and uh, Hegel is often used as a fundamental figure on both the right and the left. Right, uh, you know, Marx, you know, the Marxist, uh, uh, you know, capital, capital, uh, the capital, right? The book was based off of you know his 
uh, interpretation of the Hegelian dialectic. Uh, so what is a materialist interpretation of the Hegelian dialectic, though? Oh, so you're saying there's not going to be any kind of a a chance that you know idealism could be uh, be used as a tool of the materialists? I mean, it almost certainly could be, but materialism could also be a tool of the idealists, and we use that all the time. I mean, science is one of. Uh, the, the most convincing routes to argue for idealism, actually, even though it's generally thought of as a materialist study. Uh, well, now, to talk about science, right? Uh, I mean, you're very... Um, early on, you were defending science very much. But is science not, uh, you know, one of the main tenets of a reign of quantity? I mean, is there such thing as a, a qualitative science? Well, I'd say that science, if done correctly, makes zero ontological commitments. Science is just an investigation into what the behavior of the world is, and there's no reason that there can't be an idealistic science, uh, because even under idealism, all of the predictions of science would remain true. Uh, we just come at it with the broader understanding that w what we are investigating, uh, by and large, well, not by and large, what we're investigating exclusively is the result of mental phenomena, because what we are living in, what reality is, is part of the mind of God. It's not a material process that started randomly. Um, and that, that's the perspective of idealism, is that science will remain true. I mean, nobody disagrees. There is a world outside that, for all of us, seems the same. Uh, but we, we come at this from the perspective that that world is not fundamentally material. It is mental. And that leads to a lot of consequences downstream. But we don't have to reject science because science in and of itself is not materialistic. Materialism is just a philosophy that leverages science in its favor. Uh, okay. Uh, and, I, and I have to say I, I agree with you on most points here. Uh, but now to go back to... Uh, the original uh, contention, right, I believe was a, you know, you think that framing ideas in this way, right, is, uh, well, well, let's put it this way. I think that what you're giving is a very bulletproof way to present ideas. Uh, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. But now if we're going to talk about mass efficacy, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. For the reason that I, you know, gave early on is most people are not going to listen past, you know, the first few, uh, you know, sentences on idealism as a as an ontology, right? They they hear these words and they immediately and I check hear out. You. And uh, how? So uh, I'm just saying, if we're really trying to present ourselves, right? Uh, how do you, you know, distill that? into like a very easily digestible message how do you offer something that is like a, a simple alternative as opposed to a complicated alternative <clears throat> well you said i still got nothing it was, can you not hear me is that what's happening uh oh hello uh oh all right where'd he go I don't know. I, I think he might be. He might have. Uh, he might have just cut out, because he says I still got nothing, and now he isn't saying anything. So I guess it, maybe his internet cut out. Uh, but we'll we'll wait for him to uh, to come back. Casius, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, uh, I've always thought because uh, I know I've seen all these you know debates that go on all the time, even like a. They'll get you'll get a, a right wing guy and a left wing guy, and uh, they'll go come in for a debate. But uh, really, what happens there is they're just kind of talking about their opinion, and uh, everyone walks away having changed nothing, you know, learned nothing. And uh, this this kind of stems from the, you know. No one's really acknowledging that uh, 
our opinions kind of come from, I guess, this uh, more fundamental level differences on, you know, how we approach reality. Well, no. So I think this could be very important to figure out maybe how to explain ourselves and teach others how to explain themselves. So maybe we can, you know, have real debates. Uh, well, and I totally agree on that point. Uh, and, and let's use the, you know, the most prevalent example is like a abortion debates, right? It really, it ultimately comes down to, uh, you know, one person sees it as moral, the other person sees it as immoral, right? And they can argue about that all day. They'll say, oh, well, here's the reason why I think it's murder. And they'll say, well, here's my materialist reasoning for why it's not murder. And the only way that you will ever make progress on this is if you get into this ontology, right? You, Where are you, you know, deriving these concepts of immoral versus moral? What is valuable to you? And that is going to be more than like a 30-minute debate, you know what I mean? You really need to get the heart of these issues to form any kind of a, of a, of a change in opinion, right? Yeah, I'm back. Uh, and I actually have something to say on exactly that point. If I'm not interrupting. No, go ahead. Oh, no. Okay, so um, where I think idealism really shines is in its ethical uh, ramifications. Uh, because I think that, and there are people who argue against this, but I personally think that through materialism, you can't really come up with any uh, moving ethical position, anything that really convinces me. You know, if, if I'm coming at this from a materialist perspective, I see no reason why I shouldn't just fuck over everybody around me uh, for the sake of myself. But idealism, there is one fundamental <laughs> consequence of the theory. And uh, I guess I haven't really touched on this yet, but the core of the ontology is that via our consciousness, uh, we essentially participate in the universal ground of what reality is. Uh, my consciousness is exactly the same thing as Ozzy's consciousness, uh, just disassociated from a kind of more universal uh, mass of consciousness, I suppose you could say. Uh, but in the end, what, what me and Ozzy and Cass and everybody else is, is exactly the same thing. And there's really no reason to believe that that thing is going to die whenever I die. So coming at this from the understanding that fundamentally we are all one and the same, that's a very emotionally moving uh, a grounding for an ethical theory, right? Because if, if hurting you is fundamentally no different than hurting myself, then we really have a lot of force to argue for a real ethics that isn't grounded in just materialist um, progress, you know? Uh, I think that it gives us a route to present our positions in a much firmer way uh, with a philosophical and ontological grounding uh, that that presents things with a lot more force than anything like materialism could give. Well, now, without getting into something that is going to take us on a wide tangent, uh, well, what you just put forward... I mean, there's still a lot of issues with this as well, right? This whole, uh, you know, one in the same consciousness. Uh, because, I mean, can't you derive similarly from this uh, things like, you know, like a pu pure, <laughs> purely utilitarian philosophy? You know, if, if all of us are, you know, the same and equal consciousness, don't you just want to, you know, maximize the the benefit to the greatest number of you know, the being that is the same as yourself. Um, so I'm not sure I'm quite following what you mean. Oh, I, I'm, I'm just saying... Not, I'm not quite sure I've explained myself fully either, but, but go on. Uh, well, I, I guess I'm just saying um, it leads to... It, it's still not very absolute in a sense. Uh, you can still, you know... It, like, I, I, I feel like you could make a very easy utilitarian type of argument coming yeah, from that, that ontology still that relates to the the personal self that I feel trip up a lot of smooth brains well I wouldn't say that 
fundamental consciousness is in any way my personal self. Uh, and I think that that's still a little bit of materialism s sticking into the interpretation. Um, I'm, I'm not certain how it would necessarily lead to a utilitarian outlook, um, especially from the perspective that there is an inanimate universe and the inanimate universe has been evolving and it seems a result of that evolution has been moral decision making. So if we're coming from the perspective that the very first cause leads to secondary causes and then tertiary causes that all reflect the original thing, then moral decision making is part of that fundamental consciousness. Um, so even then, I think that it, it doesn't necessarily lead to utilitarianism because it still confirms the, the moral decision making that we all feel is intuitive. Uh, but I, I just think you're making a little bit of a leap there. I, I was just saying, based on strictly what you said, and, and like I said, I'm not as well versed in this philosophy as you are. But, you know, if you say we are all equal parts dissociated from the same one, right? Uh... Well, let's just say immediately, you know, what makes my life more or less valuable than yours. Uh, and so, well, then, if we don't have any metric for that, then all lives are equal, right? And then if we don't have any metric for that, then don't we really just want to do the best for the greatest number if everything is totally equal and there's no other metric there? Okay, well, yeah, that's that's where the confusion is coming in. Um because from the idealist perspective, all matter is fundamentally mind, which means that all of our personal being, our body and our brains, is the, it's what a mental process looks like. So fundamentally what we are is emotion and thought and feeling and memory. Uh, and then that looks like something from across a boundary. Uh, so what, what we think of as matter isn't actually material or physical, it is mental, but it looks like matter to us via the filtering process that is our perception. So it's not just that we all are perfectly equal. We all come from a common source, but we all also have personal mental processes as well. And we all, uh, there is a kernel of us that is conserved amongst all living things, but that doesn't change the fact that each and every one of us is also unique. So to say that we come from a, a universal consciousness, which seems to be the only adequate explanation, that that isn't really the same thing as saying is we're all exactly the same. So, so I guess I, I'm just still having trouble. You know, where do you derive any kind of a of like a universal moral law, as opposed to. Uh, you know, trying to maintain what is most beneficial to, like, each each person, right? Does, does that make sense? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I understand the question. How, how do you do it? Well, and, and that's where I use, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, a moral metric, right? And rather than uh, sort of the law comes first, right, and how well... Uh, you adhere to that law is, you know, your uh, gauge as a person, you know, as a soul. So you don't have to make, I mean, it makes, you know, certain moral decisions easier because of that. No, we're, we're on the same page there uh, because fundamentally, uh, whatever the primordial mind is delivered into the universe, natural law, and we can, we, we derive our morality essentially from that same source so to be moral is for us to to a certain extent conform to whatever that natural law is and i think that's a natural consequence of idealism as an ontology okay okay very interesting stuff uh so if any of us wanted to you know dive into this where would you recommend starting uh um so i actually where I got started with this was from looking at materialist debates online uh, because for quite a while I had only sort of half-assed 
left materialism myself, I was trying to come up with some kind of dual aspect theory where mind and matter were both real. Uh, but that turned out to just, it's hard to defend. Uh, so I started looking at what some materialists were arguing against people like idealists to try to get a, a gauge of the field. And one of the best videos I found was Bernardo Castro <gasps> debating uh, this guy that goes by T-Jump. Uh, so I would recommend that and other videos of Castro. He's done a lot of really good work trying to explain these ideas. He's written some good books, but I think that his videos are probably the best introduction. Uh, so look into him. If you're trying to get more of a Christian perspective, somebody like Mark Vernon, who is a, uh, a psychoanalyst, has some very good uh, videos online as well. They come at this from more of a classical theist perspective. Um, but really, I think that something like Hinduism or Christianity, uh, they are they have their differences, and I'm not going to say that they don't, but I think that fundamentally they are variations on the ontological theme of idealism. Uh, so you can, you can defend Christianity through idealism, but first I think you have to be familiar with the basics. Uh, and yeah, I would say Bernardo Castro would probably be the best person to go to for that. Well, great. Uh, so then one last thing. So uh, I still want to get onto this subject of... Uh, you know, the best way to, like, can you distill this idea down into, I don't know, even, even like a, like a slogan or some type of, uh, like a meme, you know what I mean? Like a, a mimetic way of, uh, just selling this to people, right? Cause I'd have to think about it probably, but I don't know. Not off the top of my head. I don't really have anything. Well, at the very least, I think it's good to harp on anti-materialism, right? And, and as, as soon as you can open up the floor for that, and if somebody is, you know, at least willing to have the discussion, then this is there, right? I mean, I think, yeah, uh, we're probably not going to be changing a lot of minds, Um but even just having the basis of presenting ourselves in a more, like you said, a more bulletproof way, it can only be good in the future. True. <clears throat> uh, well, Casey, Casey, do you have anything else you wanted to add? Hmm. No, uh, I guess I'm just sitting here digesting all of this. Yeah, and there's a lot to digest. Uh, well, Sid, anything, uh, any final statement you wanted to make? Um, I think that was uh, my main ramble. If you guys wanted to try to outline some points to go into more depth on if we're trying to actually write out something of a mission statement, I'd be down to continue on with that, maybe even just cut stream and brainstorm. But, uh, I mean, that was my main spiel. Well, I think Actually, that, I had something to add. Go ahead. I think uh, something that uh, maybe uh, the disconnect that would cause Ozzy to think of a, you know, utilitarianism or some kind of weird ideology that would pop up in this framework. Uh, you didn't really explain that. Uh, kind of either your consciousness and all we all have the same you know, spark of consciousness, but, uh, you know, if we add that, that that's, uh, you know, that spark of divinity, you know, that connection to God, natural law, all of that, you know, that is what our consciousness is. And I think there, uh, our morality kind of becomes like explicitly like how we're supposed to live, you know, yeah, I agree with that entirely. So I think I think having that kind of removes the possibility for some kind of utilitarianism or any other kind of weird thing to pop up. Yeah, I think there might be a little bit of a misunderstanding in terms here uh, because when I say consciousness, I don't necessarily mean the self-reflective sense of I that we normally have, right? 
Uh, Because there's a lot of what we are conscious of that we aren't actively aware that we are conscious of. Um, And so there's a certain level of consciousness that is transcendent of the individual person. And I I honestly touched on this in the stream that a lot of psychologists have kind of downgraded this to the, the subconscious, which more and more people think that that's a little bit vulgar. Uh, but there is a huge portion of what we are that we aren't self-reflectively aware of and that can lead people to transcendent experiences that really shape uh, their, their personal personality. Um, so I think that whenever p- part of the reason that this idea seems to be leading to a utilitarianism is that I think Ozzy might be thinking of consciousness as that self-reflective meta-consciousness, the sense of I that seeks things and, and wants things for itself, whereas the, the universal consciousness I'm talking about is very different from that. I guess it would start at the uh, most basic, the basic level of just awareness. Yeah, essentially, it's like the, the capacity to experience. And we yes. experience a lot of things without knowing that we experience them. Absolutely. All right. Well, yeah, and I, I think the main thing that you definitely want to uh, harp on from there, and uh, it, uh, I guess you didn't really go into it too much, uh, but natural law, right? That's something that you know it just comes up, uh, it comes up consistently, and the more you, you the more you can you know, clearly lay out where that's derived and how that's derived, the better off and more bulletproof your position is. Uh, do you agree? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, well, I think that's definitely a good starting point, right? Uh, so I said, I think if you, um, uh, these two things, right, and, and they kind of go hand in hand, right? Anti-materialism and natural law. And, and the more clearly you can articulate, you know, the, the uh, you know, I guess what would you call it, the epistemology of these two things, uh, then the better off we're going to be. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, if we're going to do any brainstorming, that's a very good place to start. Yeah, I do agree. I would agree. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I would just say that all in all, if we're trying to present ourselves as a legitimate movement, uh, there's just two or three areas where we really have to spell ourselves out, and that's the ontology, the ethics, and uh, phenomenology or epistemology. Uh, Like, how do we know things, what is there, and how should we be? And if we can do that um, and present ourselves in a way that we can defend in really any framework, because I think that we all agree that a group needs to be able to defend themselves, right? Like none of us are complete pacifists. Well, right now we have to accept that the field of battle that we're on is a, is an intellectual one. And we have to be able to take our ideas out into the field and defend them. Uh, so I think that if we're trying to do that, we have just a few areas we really need to flush out and then we have a pretty sturdy foundation. So when I get fired for being a radical right-wing extremist, I'll just bring out my idealist ontology and uh, they'll just have to hire me back you know <laughs> you know uh, no but I mean that's just a joke but uh, yeah and I, I mean it just goes back to exactly what you're saying you know the more you can uh, laying out these things in an intellectual way it does go a bit farther than just you know slurs right <laughs> um, it uh and it's for sure more productive towards people who are hostile exactly uh yeah well i don't know how much more i have to add and uh i do have to get up for work in the morning so uh yeah with that if you guys have nothing left to say i think we're gonna sign off that sounds good appreciate your time y'all all right oh and uh plug yourself before you go what? Plug yourself, your your Odyssey channel. Oh yeah, fuck. Um, everybody, check out my Odyssey channel. 
Western Philosophy Project at Satanta. Uh, just Spell go get that. everything. With. I got four or five episodes out right now. S E T A N T A. N T A. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So go follow him. And uh, yeah. Well, good night, everybody. I hope you enjoyed. And uh, I haven't. <laughs> we haven't selected a, a reading for next week yet. But uh, if you follow it on Telegram and follow in the Discord, uh, we will get there. Uh, yeah, but thanks for watching, thanks for checking in, and uh, have a good night.